an only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey. I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and the Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, September 13th, we will hear the presentation, Green Parking, Sustainable Urban Mobility, and Placemaking. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the question box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. <coughs> On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I'd like to thank all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Transportation Planning Division. For more information on this division and how to become a member, visit planning.org slash divisions slash transportation. And to learn more about all the divisions offered, visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of some of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM, select today's date, and today's webcast. And this webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. Of course, like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by the Chapters and Divisions. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. Also, a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available upon request. Just email me at planningwebcast at yahoo.com. Now I'd like to turn it over to Gabriella, who is the webinar coordinator for the Transportation Planning Division, and she's going to introduce our speaker, Gabriella. Hello, everyone. Um, we're really excited about today's topic. We have our amazing presenter, Mark Gander, who um, I think if you are signed up, you probably already know everything great about him. Um, he works for AECOM and brings a, just a plethora of information and he's just wonderful and we're super, super excited about it. And so I believe that his presentation is going to just invigorate all of you so much and motivate you to do your own webinar. So please contact me with your topic and I'm going to be so excited to coordinate one with you in the future and we can do this together. Um, I also want to thank Mark greatly and Chris for doing all the hard work in putting this webinar together. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Mark, and you all have a great, great webinar. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending upon where you're um, situated. Um, I'm Mark Gander work here in the AECOM New York office and um, um, pleased to be here. I want to thank the American Planning Association, Transportation Planning Division, and Gabriella for the fine um, introduction um, that she uh, provided to this. I am also um, would like to mention that I am on the board of directors and chair the advisory committee of a group um, called the Green Parking Council. And you'll see through this um, presentation that hopefully you won't think of the words green parking as, as an oxymoron after this. Um, and many of the um, members and colleagues that are part of the Green Parking Council um, find lots of inspiration and um, energy from working in this platform of trying to green the parking um, parking garage. Um, so um, I think it's very uh, important to 
look at the Green Parking Council information, and I'll be happy to follow up with anyone uh, after uh, today's uh, presentation. Put up a parking lot With a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot Don't it always seem to go That you don't know what you've got till it's gone You can't paradise, put up a parking lot Okay, so um, parking is changing directions just as the automobile industry, in particular, and urban mobility provisions are undergoing major transformative changes in design, fuel, customer base, and offerings, so the parking industry and offerings are changing. The signs are all there. Today I'll cover those topics that you see on your screen, listed one through seven. We'll talk about some trends. We'll look at the lot. We'll talk about sustainable mobility, changing nature of parking, what are some next moves ahead, and how we can make a better place. What is an AECOM? Well, AECOM has a large platform. We work in 130 countries at the moment. We have about uh, 45,000 employees, in which 35% are US-based. We cover architecture, planning, economics, engineering, construction, transportation, energy, government services, pretty much all services and disciplines that intersect with the natural and built environment uh, we provide to our um, clients that are based around the world. Um, we um, are very much involved in the transformation and mobility and parking uh, through our leadership on the Green Parking Council, um, our chief executive um, our Chief Sustainability Officer, Gary Lawrence, is on the Advisory Committee. I serve on the Board of Directors and Chair of the Advisory Committee also. AECOM's vision for a more sustainable future drives much of our work, including the foundation of how we operate as a company. This commitment is visible in the everyday practices of our people and our projects, whether through the services we provide through the voluntary efforts for sustainable causes in the community. We really aim at trying to create, enhance, and sustain the world's built, natural, and social environments. Harnessing our resources wisely is what will enable people all over the globe to enjoy a higher standard of living, and that is good news for companies. But there is no economic future for us or for companies if the resources they convert are depleted. Sustainability is the best competitive business approach we have to using scarce resources wisely and effectively, minimizing waste and making smart investment decisions for an uncertain future. Sustainability for ACOM then is many things. It's both an operating philosophy, a point of view, a way that we provide services to our clients, and something for which we advocate passionately. The global shift to clean energy, sustainable mobility, innovative economies, equitable living standards is all about systems, and not just one system either. It interacts with politics, regulation, and finance, as well as with adjacent industries such as transportation, real estate, and telecoms. One of the main implications is that of this analysis is that <clears throat> at the level of just one parking and mobility solution in planning and design technology deployment will only get you so far if you just look at it singularly. The value of a solar array on a rooftop on a parking garage in the world of electric vehicles is very different from the value of the same solar rooftop in the world without. The value uh, the demand response is negligible in the world optimized around base load plus peak generating capacity. The value of energy efficiency is negligible in a world of fuel subsidies and so on. The reality of, of the world's mobility and energy transition that 
for, that's before us right now is that it's dynamic, complex, unpredictable. So because it's these things, we move towards efficiency, flexibility, being responsive, providing open data, transparency, and the building of coalitions. So what are some trends that are before us, and what are some solutions? Urbanization. By the mid-1920s, cities will be home to more than 70% of the global population, which is up from 50% now. 90% of the population growth will be in urban areas, which will account for 80% of the wealth. Hence, the pattern of future energy demand and mobility innovations will be determined by urban networks. Transportation and building operations typically account for about 60% of energy, urban energy use. In congested urban areas, about 40% of total gasoline use is in cars looking for parking. Air quality in some places, breathing air in polluted metropolitan areas such as Los Angeles or Riverside where the air collects towards the east can reduce your life expectancy from two to three or even longer. It has a very harsh effect on children's growth rates. But it's improving in Los Angeles and in Riverside with the introduction of um, mobility enhancements, transit, improved living conditions, walkability, etc. Congestions cost Americans over $100 billion in 2010. Traditional fuel sources will eventually be depleted. The United States relies on a net imports for about 45% of the petroleum that we consumed in 2011. Vehicle miles traveled is declining. Driving in America is stalled as recent collection of data has said. Leading research to ask, is the national love affair with the automobile over? After rising for decades, the total vehicle use in the U.S. peaked in about August of 2007. It then dropped shortly during the Great Recession and has largely plateaued since then, even though the economy is recovering in some spots and the population is growing. Just this past uh, few months, the Federal Highway Administration reported vehicle miles traveled during the first half of 2013 were down slightly, continuing this trend. Or is it a trend? For six decades, Americans have tended to drive more every year. But in the middle of the last decade, the number of miles driven both overall and per capita began to drop. This was recently noted in a recent U.S. Um, PERG study, a nonprofit advocacy um, organization. People tend to drive less during recessions, for sure, since fewer people are working and commuting. And most are looking for ways to save money. Or changes are preceded to the recent recession and appear to be part of a structural shift that is largely rooted in changing demographics, especially the rise of the so-called millennials which is today's teenagers and 20-somethings. In fact, younger people are less likely to drive or even have a driver's license than past generations for whom driving was a norm. And this is not a trend in the United States at all, but really appears throughout Europe and all the other com uh, countries, as shown in the graphic. So we see some various trend lines here and uh, how the, the by demographic segment and where this might be uh, leading based on what the prediction level was. So the long-term future casting might even be more dramatic about this, and here's some reasons why. Population continues to grow and change. We wonder what the impact will be of boomers and millennials that we discussed earlier. We know that our economy is in transition. It's been moving from a 9 to 5 to becoming more 24-7, 365. 
There's a dominance now of tech, education, and healthcare sectors that are uh, moving in the economy. You've heard about innovation centers and the innovation um, economy. All this has implications for transportation and urban form. Fewer um, traditional nine to five jobs that are being in the fire, finance, insurance, real estate, management, administrative support sectors that we're seeing. There's the emergence of the non-traditional work patterns. There's no longer uh, just limited to peak hours or focusing just within the uh, downtowns or central business districts of our urban areas. There's an increase in part-time self-employment and telecommuting work. Another trend is the emergence of new regional business hubs. Suburban employment growth continues to grow and the demand for uh, labor. So is this, are these trends with the BMT decline becoming the new normal? This is something that I think we'll see more and more research and literature on and implications for uh, urban areas through their metropolitan planning organizations and other professional bodies such as American Planning Association and trying to come to grips with these trend lines of declining BMT and what it would mean for transportation in urban form. We might love our cars, certainly those in Los Angeles, Texas, Chicago, but we certainly don't spend much time in them. Here is the city car, or what's called the MIT city car. It's an urban all-electric concept car design at the MIT Media Lab. The project was conceived by the late, late William J. Mitchell and his Smart Cities Research Group. It is now led by Ken Larson, who's the director of the Changing Places Research Group at the Media Lab. The project came into conception around 2003 under the support of General Motors. The city car weighs less than 1,000 pounds, is 60% the size of a smart car, and its lithium-ion battery pack is expected to deliver the equivalent of 150 to 200 miles per gallon range with no tailpipe emissions. Time magazine selected the city car as one of the best inventions of 2007. Here called Driving Mobility, which is a Spanish consortium, developed a commercial version of this car on the city car concept and began manufacturing pre-test production of the car in 2012, this last year. The production car is called Hiroko and it began a trial late in last year, in July of 2012, as part of a broad car sharing program. And the car is reaching other markets and developing business model arrangements with many car rental places, car sharing programs. Once buried and left for dead, the electric vehicle, or even if you think about it, the autonomous vehicle that Google cars and many of the other auto uh, um, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, are moving forward on. But the electric vehicle has been gaining ground at a slow yet steady pace in the automotive market. I think we, though, will reach the 1 million vehicles, EV vehicles in 2015, that was the um, President Obama objective fairly soon. It seems as though the pace has pick it, picked up dramatically. With the growing middle class globally and climate change concerns is really helping revitalize the EVs, not to mention the mandates that occur within the um, United States with the 11 zero emission vehicle states that are primarily along the west and east coasts. These mandates drive the market for EVs. Look at California market is, is surging with the EVs with Tesla and Toyota dominating most of the market um, share. EV lithium batteries prices will become rapidly more efficient and costs will be dropping. 
we now see that the uh, DC, what's called the level three or DC fast charging, is further repelling the rate of EV sales. As rapid installation of DC electric vehicle charging infrastructure is occurring, in particular within the 11 zero emission vehicle states I mentioned. The um, time to fully charge a battery with the DC charging is dramatically reduced to 20 minutes or less uh, for a full complete charge um, of a battery compared to a level two charger which is typical within households or other places in parking garages takes several several hours to fully top off your battery. Here in New York there's an ambitious goal of 10,000 electric charging stations which are mostly going to be located in parking areas and public garages and airports. Innovation drives change. The car industry has waited well over a century for its own revolution. Today the wait, I believe, is over. What the mo mobile phone did for communications, electric mobility will do for individual mobility. But it's important to think really beyond the automobile. This is a, the scale of the mobility innovations is much bigger and broader than the car. Door-to-door -door connectivity, smart mobility means making the complete connection using technology like in-car sensors and connectivity to gather and integrate information that helps smooth traffic flows. It's about managing demand and increasing the capacity of existing networks while reducing costs, accidents, and pollution. New automobile technologies like electric vehicles is bringing into play whole new systems of integration with opportunities beyond the auto to create better places. The transformation in mobility is creating a new mobility industry. The cities of the near future will be getting smart using a combination of high and low tech solutions. The new mobility includes such diverse modalities as peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, shared use mobility, integrated wayfinding, electric vehicles that we mentioned, a new investment in mass transit systems including bus rapid transit. Many components of the smart cities are already everywhere such as smartphones and others are in rapid ascent like bicycle lanes, electric vehicles, mixed use development and the redevelopment that's occurring around multimodal transit hubs. So from the electric vehicle to car sharing to smartphones to intelligent transportation systems and Wi-Fi lampposts, new technologies and designs are being applied to optimize infrastructure, reduce congestion, and address the challenges of climate change. Who would have think that you would rent a room or a car or a bike or a lawnmower from a total stranger via the internet? Yet millions of people are already doing just that. People across the world are sharing everything from surfboards to saxophones. Most of the auto OEMs, Ford, Toyota, Nissan, Chevy, GM, have begun car sharing programs such as Daimler's car to go that operates in the northwest, San Francisco and some cities in the northeast. Uh, and BMW's Drive Now program, which operates in California, primarily um, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, but also within New York City area. So these Drive Now or Car to Go programs that I just mentioned, like a bike sharing operation, are unique because these car sharing arrangements provide patrons point A to point B connections, connectivity. No longer do you have to return back to the origin. Easily accessible via smartphone app are these services. 
digital connectivity is extended to most all auto rental companies. You see Hertz, Avis, Enterprise entering into the car sharing uh, business um, area that Zipcar, which is operating on the East Coast, and other um, car sharing arrangements um, have dominated for many, for many years. In many cities, then we are seeing that more and more people are using bicycles and buses. And we are seeing the increasing integration of mobility using data so that people can use different modes of transportation. There are more apps becoming available to give people more information about journeys uh, that they're taking. So to sum up, there's a set of seven interrelated trends driving new approaches to urban mobility. Today we are at the cusp of a transformation for cities that's generally phrased as the new mobility. That's accelerated by the emergence of new fuel and vehicle technologies new information technologies, flexible and differentiated transportation modes, services, and products, innovative land use and urban design, and new business models. Collaborative partnerships are being initiated in a variety of ways to address the gro gro <clears throat> growing challenges of urban transportation and to provide a basis for a vital new mobility industry. Ultimately, everything is connected. There is a need to invest in community connections rather than just focus on increasing the capacity of routes. Parking locations should serve as connecting points in the transportation mix, not as an endpoint. This idea stands in stark contrast to efforts that are currently underway to widen highways, which will more generally get people to a place where they will meet a snarl of traffic and no spots in which to park. So in densely populated area, parking structures must be made to be adaptable. The average parking structure may last 50 or 60 years, but the environment around it changes much more quickly. Parking structures must be viewed as mixed-use facilities in urban environments. They can't generate enough revenue as standalone elements to compete with more valuable properties. And as they stand now, they are underutilized. Parking garages must be designed for people and not for cars. As MIT professor Ben Joseph points out in his recent book, Rethinking the Lot, and he states that a successful parking lot is one that integrates site conditions and context, takes measures to mitigate its impact on the environment, and gives consideration to aesthetics as well as the driver parker experience. Designed with a conscientious intent, parking lots could become significant public spaces. There are approximately 250 million registered vehicles in the United States or more. When these vehicles are not in use, which accounts for 90% of their time, they must be parked. Because of this, the off-street parking space available is everywhere. It's footprint vast in scale. Sometimes parking lots cover more than a third of the land area in area in cities, becoming the single most salient landscape feature of our built environment. This ubiquity is further compounded because cities require parking everywhere, yet ironically its absence is noticed most. We might love our cars, but we certainly don't spend much time with them. The 2012 Emerging Trends in Parking Survey by the International Parking Institute reveals a number of interesting facts about the place, the vehicles we love to spend time with most, parking spaces. According to the survey, about 30% of most traffic in city comes from people looking for parking spaces. Most cars are parked 90% of the time, as we mentioned. While well, often an afterthought, creating good parking spaces is essential in creating a more efficient, more sustainable, or even more walkable environment. Parking lots need to be easy to enter, a breeze to leave, and easy to pay for. If not, parking can make any place a frustration for someone to visit or live. 
the survey points out. Technology and green sustainable solutions rate high in major trends that are occurring within the parking industry overall. Parking matters. It plays an important role in the success of cities, communities, and places, as well as the development of mixed-use projects and sustainable transportation. The location and quantity of parking spaces, whether it's structured in garages or surface lots, are pivotal to enabling pedestrian environments to flourish. Parking is an industry ripe for technological and strategic transformation. Urban parking is a nexus of suburban and urban car and other forms of mobility, a relatively untapped platform, we think, and technologically underdeveloped. It is a canvas waited to be, waiting to be painted on. In the photo, we see the National Security Agency that's in Fort Meade, Maryland, um, near Baltimore. It's built on 350 acres within the Fort Meade. It's 5,000 acres. The site has an estimated 18,000 parking spaces. Parking requirements are a policy choice that lies at the intersection of land use and transportation. Favoring private vehicle transportation, parking could reduce the competitiveness of other travel node, nodes such as transit. Parking leads to a one-dimensional transportation system based on private vehicles that is not resilient in the face of disruptions such as energy crisis or requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As a land use, parking affects design and urban form by shaping site design, lowering density, and contributing to sprawl in its furthest extent. So, the question of right-sizing parking is very important um, in most urban areas, especially for transit-oriented development. A transit-oriented development type of urban form necessitates a multi-pronged approach to understand the existing and projected parking utilization and the available supply in and around a uh, TOD project area such as the projected demand for new parking spaces once the project is completed. Key elements include the understanding of the differences among the markets, unbundling or separating the full cost of parking from the associated use, and reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements for certain land uses or certain areas. Understanding the parking uses by market and the type then make it possible for us as planners to look for opportunities for change and implementation of, of a wide range of measures from new technology, the utilization of smart parking and other technology devices, uh, for instance, aimed at uh, providing parking solutions, to say uh, specific policies and physical design modifications that consolidate and locate parking more efficiently. Conducting a diagnostic parking study that is comprehensive and aligned with mobility choices is essential to this effort. Once the facts about demand, price, utilization, the built form, and development patterns are known and household characteristics are understood, then appropriate strategies can be calibrated to each place. Why should parking go green? Parking, like all industries, is driven by consumer demand. And as we read and know that consumers are demanding green, the parking business is about running an efficient operation with basic amenities and marketing the quality of this operation to customers. Sustainability is an opportunity to increase the efficiency, lower the waste, and bring a higher level of amenity to the customer. Parking can help our society transition to becoming more environmentally responsible. It lowers our impact on the environment, and it could make the Earth a better home for all of us. The parking garage and the lot 
can become the center of trends and opportunities that we see. We see parking as an enabler of that process and parking facilities as a key tool in the process of sustainable mobility. Cars are parked 90% of the time. How can we capitalize on this opportunity? With electric vehicles, there's much discussion about what's called vehicle to grid, V2G, uh, integrating the electric vehicle into a decentralized island or smart grid um, arrangement so that there's backup resiliency and more efficient flow of electrons, electricity uh, to, to an area, to a market area. How can parking help to limit these problems of urbanization that we talked about er earlier, reduce the risk of resource depletion, and meet the changing demands of the consumer? We see that parking can evolve from a garage into a sustainable service center and intermodal hub. More than a location just to store vehicles in, here we see parking as connecting points for various types of mobility hubs, be it buses, trains, light rail, trams, car sharing, bicycles, and connecting points for pedestrians, and also a place for alternative refueling locations such as EVs. This evolution will allow garages to catalyze, we think, an increase in air quality and lower levels of congestion in urban areas, as well as help to turn the facilities into sources of economic and community renewal. Parking mobility services are growing at an alarming rate. Between 30 or 75 percent of traffic in congested downtown areas is caused by people cruising for parking, according to a report that UCLA Professor Don Shoup, and also a member of the Green Parking Council Advisory Committee, um, found out a few years ago from his 70 years of research on the subject. Drivers in major cities, including San Francisco, Sydney, New York, and London, spend between many, many times looking for parking. The city of Los Angeles recently installed some low power sensors and smart meters to track the occupancy of parking spaces throughout the Hollywood district. That's one of the most congested areas in the city. And these sensors are about the size of a coffee cup lid and are embedded in the asphalt. The smart meter is attached to regular meters and allow users to pay with their mobile phones in addition to communicating payment information to the city. With the information from the sensors then, the city is able to change pricing on its parking depending on demand, raising it for special events or a particular busy hour, for instance, the information also becomes an enforcement vehicle, uh, giving information about expired parking meters and other parking violations and reduces the time um, enforcement people spend driving around in circles looking for parking. Other cities, private parking operators have implemented um, what's called yield management systems to monitor and adjust pricing and the availability parking spaces with users accessing this information via smartphone and applications. So in many areas in the US, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Seattle, and Portland, we see uh, proliferation of yield management systems that provide real-time information to drivers looking for parking spaces and and prevents the cruising effect and looking around for parking and gives uh, rather timely information about the availability and pricing of parking in an area. Also um, helps the area by reducing congestion and better manages the supply and flow of cars and vehicles through the area. Up until about 2011, Parking garages uh, received the um, USGBC LEED environmental efficiency uh, rating. 
examples are the Santa Monica Convention Center uh, parking garage and also uh, Duke University's parking, which this cast in place post tension concrete parking structure uh, was one of the first U.S. Green Building Council LEED certified parking facilities. Then in around 2011, USGBC may had a ruling that parking garages may not pursue LEED certification. This provided an opportunity for the Green Parking Council to step up and fill in the gap. Right now, the Green Parking Council is collaborating with the USGBC on program refinement for parking and if you think about it, the owners and operators of green buildings that are applying for LEED certification likely will desire a unified and comprehensive certification that's provided um, within the Green Parking Council programs, which I'll elaborate on in a few slides. So the parking industry is changing. Patrons, demographics using parking are changing, both through aging, the millennials, driver's licensing later, and, or don't owning a car, urban living or car sharing arrangements, cost of ownership and vehicle maintenance, environmental concerns, sustainability, greenhouse gas reductions, and resiliency adaptation actions are all coming into play and affect the parking industry and the parking industry and its affiliates and stakeholders are responding. The Green Parking Council was formed and recognized as an important driver for sustainable solutions in this mobility space. Recently, the Green Parking Council formed an alliance with the International Parking Institute. We are essentially their, their green arm. We feel that innovative and modern parking facilities will play a major role in future mobility solutions. City, central, and urban parking, these mobility hubs will be key for individual and future-based mobility solutions. Parking is about the spaces between people in motion, and the Green Parking Council collaborates and innovates in this space, this parking space, to strengthen both communities and the planet. The Green Parking Council emerged from leaders in and around the parking industry motivated by a vision of parking as part of the solution. The Green Parking Council is a national 501c3 organization based in New Haven, Connecticut, with affiliations around the company country. It provides leadership and oversight for the green conversion of parking facilities to sustainable, environmentally responsible assets. We are an affiliate of the International Parking Institute, the largest and leading trade organization representing parking professionals in the parking industry worldwide. We're dedicated to an expanding parking, green parking practice through developing certification and credentialing programs open source standards, professional leadership, and general education. Green Parking Council works at the intersection of green parking, green building, clean technology, renewable energy, smart grid infrastructure, urban planning, and sustainable mobility. By challenging us to collaborate and create open source sustainable best practices, the Green Parking Council encourages exceptional industry transformation. We have many partners. Our partners are organized in and around the parking industry that are interested in sustainability. Members from many of the auto OEMs, Nissan, BMW, et cetera, real estate companies, some of the largest in the United States are members of the Green Parking Council, and also the parking, of course, the parking owners and operators, technology and service providers. The Green Parking Council covers over 20,000 locations and for nearly 5 million parking spots, representing nearly half the parking footprint in North America. Our tools are many in our box. We have Green Garage Certification, which integrates 50 
discrete technology programs and management practices into a transformational lever moving the parking industry into sustainability. The green garage certification was developed and tested and endorsed by building owners, managers, parking operators, manufacturers, like an industry specific LED, uh, lead program. The um, certification program of the Green Parking Council defines the standards for parking sustainability and the goal for parking owners and operators. This um, certification program is currently in its beta phase and we received many comments and um, refinements are underway. Our other tool that we have is the green garage credentialing. The parking industry has long-standing tradition of industry-specific training programs leading to formal industry credentials. The Green Car Parking Council has developed the Green Garage Credentialing Program based upon the foundation of this certification program. This was launched in the mid-2013. Parking operators are currently budgeted for green parking credentialing of their staff. Our other tool is Sustainable Technologies Online Database, which is an open source access to tools resource. This is a virtual gathering place for users, innovators, and entrepreneurs to learn about existing and emerging technologies and engage in peer-to-peer -peer product evaluations. Another tool that we use is the Building a Community of Parking Sustainability. The Green Parking Council's partnership program fosters education, relationship building, business-to-business -business partnerships, marketing opportunities, and accelerating adoption of new technologies. We also have several strategic initiatives uh, that we have underway. Examples include um, our work in Mountain View, California's transportation planning, our stormwater uh, runoff mitigation work in Philadelphia, our integrated parking and car sharing initiatives that are underway in San Francisco and New York, and our national work with uh, BOMA, the IFMA, the Department of Energy on High Performance Energy Efficient Lighting. And there are many other types of programs and tools that we use that include sustainable urban mobility and the creation of healthy cities and ongoing outreach and community building um, efforts. The Green Parking Council demonstration sites were launched in 2009 as a precursor to the Green Parking Certification Program, which brings recognition and marketability to parking facilities deploying green approaches. Demonstration sites are offered to Green Parking Council partners for their own or their clients' facilities. In 2013, 50, um, this year, around 50 parking facilities across North America were registered as demonstrator sites. We also hold a series of webinars, typically one every week or more, across a range of topics such as EV charging, parking lighting efficiency. Um, we also looked at the um, Department of Energy um, garage near Denver, Colorado. We had a very good webinar on automated parking garages and charging methods and networks, uh, one on cool pavement, and others on lighting, um, lighting issues, controls, and other incentives. The Green Certification Program of the Green Parking Council um, is a real transformational tool that's recognizing and inspiring high performance, sustainable parking facility design, technology and management. This certification both was born um, of the parking industry veterans troubled by the degradation of the planet and seeking a response to leverage their business. So Green Parking Council certification defines the attributes of sustainable parking structures and challenges us to build and operate parking in ways respectful of the planet. Certification is both a roadmap and an assessment tool for real estate owners, developers, planners, architects, tenants, parking operators, and others working to maximize the built environment's contribution to a more environmentally and economically sustainable future.
the components and elements of the um, green parking certification program takes into account both the efficiency and amenities that were part of the original vision of the Green Parking Council, but has grown um, to encompass many, many more attributes. This green parking uh, certification uh, program was developed over three years by a passionate group of volunteers and experts in the parking industry. Um, over 150 parking leaders, sustainability experts, and technologists contributed to the 44 elements that comprise the green parking certification. These elements are grouped into three categories, addressing how we manage our facilities, the programs we offer, and the technologies and structures we deploy. The program applies to both retrofits and new construction and provides the foundation for a future program for parking lots. The certification handbook is being field tested by parking and sustainability consultants and is recognized uh, as sustainable garages in North American parking ecosystem, including Green Parking Council's demonstrator sites. This work of uh, field testing will allow us to benchmark the performance of existing high performance facilities and hone the certification tool and calibrate the assessment system, and in particular, the points that are assigned, similar to the way the USGBC lead effort assigns points to various uh, building efficiency initiatives and measures. Green Garage Certification is an evolving program incorporating new technologies and approaches as they emerge. We draw optimism from robust innovation in parking technologies, increasing integration of parking, traffic, and vehicle technologies with each other and the grid, and the emphasis on life cycle analysis and the blossoming of the eco-design movement. Innovation measures allow us for the introduction of and recognition for new approaches to green parking. Over time, some of these innovative approaches will move into mainstream and be incorporated into later versions, we imagine, of the green parking certification. Let's dig in and look at a few examples from the booklet. Electrification Coalition states that um, 1 million electric vehicles will be deployed in the United States by 2015. This translates into a significant reductions in hydrocarbon emissions and the use of carbon-based fuels. Widespread deployment of these electric vehicle EVSEs supports the overall efforts towards transportation and electrification and improves the national charging infrastructure. There are several different levels of EVs in North America. We have the level one charging, which is 120 uh, volts charging devices that plugs into a, a regular three-pronged household power outlet, usually considered portable equipment. We have level two charging, 280 to 250 volt charging device, permanently wired electric vehicle supply equipment, the standard plug for North America. We have then the fast charging or the DC charging, which is a high voltage, sometimes referred to as uh, fast charging. There are two standard plugs that are being used. The um, CHAdeMO, which is um, primarily originated in, um, in Asia, and what's called the SAE1772, um, which is not yet ratified. And then there's the future of um, induction charging, which is wireless charging that provides power to vehicles via coil mounted at the bottom of the vehicle cars, which is not currently outfitted, but 
in, in the future, we imagine that the parking garage would become a platform for uh, all of these type of charging devices. In fact, most of the charging infrastructure uh, are installed within the parking. Structured parking facilities exist within the context of a community, a neighborhood, or an urban district. And these facilities bring patrons to park for a variety of uses. We're seeing that placemaking as an important component within Green Garage certification. So parking structures serve as a gateway to the community and deliver not only parking services, but also pedestrians to the city and the neighborhoods. There are many examples that I'm going to show about uh, the parking garage as a place, which um, overturns the general view of parking as a sterile green structure. It can be much, much more. Pictured here is 111 Lincoln Road. You can see that a wedding is occurring in the back corner. Parking can aspire to address some fundamental truths about placemaking. Generally, we think of seven, six or seven things that make up placemaking. People got to like a place that other people like. People like to have a sense of belonging. People like to engage in an authentic place. People like places that have a diversity of uses. People like places that are quality spaces. And people like places that are accessible to all. And then also people like places that have a resilience, a permanency. All these attributes of placemaking, green parking Kelsey, and parking garages can aspire to. Here are some examples of different forms of placemaking and different quality and types of parking. We have in the upper far left corner of your screen the Miami Green Garage for Aquatonics with ground floor retail in an urbanized setting. The vegetative plantings are attractors for birds and critters that make home in the upper levels of the garage. You see uh, on the far right Cal State University Fullerton 700 space parking garage with a solar array on top. Right below it, we see in Hoboken, New Jersey, an automated parking, one of the first in the country garage, which blends with the streetscape and building faces. The bottom two pictures on the left, we see um, the Christopher Columbus mixed use garage also called The Wave, which is in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And it's a self-contained power net zero building. The garage includes a number of sustainable design features. It includes a roof of the solar array and a charging station for electric vehicles. The charging promotes walkability in this section of Atlantic City. And we see other examples of quality public spaces. In the middle is a parking garage with a public plaza and that shows um, movies and, and uh, film in the evenings with a parking garage uh, beneath the green roof. A great example that is recently being uh, brought forward is in Philadelphia. It's located at the 8th and Filbert Street Philadelphia Parking Authority. It's near the Arch and Market Street areas in downtown Philadelphia. It's being championed uh, by the owner of the garage, the Philadelphia Parking Authority. They recently had a shred uh, called Realizing the Urban Potential, Achieving a Sense of Place of Vitality on the 8th Street Garage. So the goal of the project is to revitalize this parking asset. The project includes repairing, modernizing, beautifying, and developing sustainable strategies for this 60-year 1,200 space parking garage and its 30,000 square feet of retail space with improved landscaping along 8th Street and a contiguous section along um, Arch Street. The garage is very well located, a short walk to the Independence Mall, the Convention Center, 
the gallery shopping, Galleria shopping complex in Philly, Chinatown, and the Reading Terminal Market, and a block away from the SEPTA um, commuter rail train stations at 8th Street and Market. A rendering of what it will or could become. The Philadelphia project is a tremendous example of the type of transformation that is occurring within the parking industry, both locally and globally, as municipalities utilize smart parking technology and green parking design to achieve low carbon cities. This drive towards low carbon cities has caused parking to become increasingly understood as an infrastructure asset that could function as a strategic enabler for urban mobility, place making, and community renewal. They have a very um, aspiring criteria and objectives to um, both improve and create a sense of place in and around the parking garage. This is a before. This is an after. The retail corridor that runs beneath the garage as envisioned afterwards. Certification and lighting controls is important to produce light only when and where it is needed. A reduction in the time of the lighting fixtures are illuminated or in the number of fixtures that are illuminated has a direct effect on the electricity consumption of the parking garage. This reduction in electrical consumption increases the sustainability characteristics of a parking structure. There's stormwater management. What is the parking solution to that? Parking and roadway services play a significant role in how stormwater runoff affects our environment. These services often are called uh, collect hydrocarbons associated with petroleum um, products. Many cities are developing ambitious plans to effectively unpave city land as a way to stop directing polluted runoff into municipal waterways and begin managing rainwater on site through green infrastructure practices. These practices include trees, rain gardens, permeable pavement, and other green development that mimic natural processes to infiltrate, clean, evaporate, and reuse stormwater on or near the site where water falls or collects. An integrated solution of a complete street is shown here that addresses stormwater runoff, resiliency, emergency preparedness. Here we see a typical suburban shopping center lot transformed to address stormwater and create shade in an appealing environment. This picture has irony in many ways. First, it was based in an abandoned oil refinery um, north of Tel Aviv, Israel. Better place developed infrastructure that makes electric cars more affordable, convenient, and sustainable than gas powered vehicles via what was a revolutionary switchable battery model. Founded first in Silicon Valley, they were a venture-based global company with operations in Israel, Denmark, Australia, Europe, North America, Japan, and China. Unfortunately, um, today, or last year, near this time, uh, the Better Place organization um, folded, but it is now merged in with other renewable companies within Israel that are producing um, solar, uh, <clears throat> solar equipment and renewables. Israel, like many um, other countries, has a very high uh, goal to create almost a uh, net zero country, very green aspirational goals. An example of sort of what the Green Parking Council uh, gets involved in in the community is through an upcoming innovation salon, the second one. The next one is next week, September 17th in New York City at the BMW iVenture offices. 
these uh, um, salons, as they're, as they're called, continue to foster innovation and celebrate leadership in ways that parking structures and spaces are created, managed, and utilized, and ultimately incorporate into the fabric of life. Last year, um, we had an innovation salon with the Metropolitan Magazine, um, my company, ACOM, the Urban Land Institute, the Regional Plan Association, and we talked about sustainable parking. This year's salon, we're going to dig deeper into the details of looking at the um, lighting, looking at the electrical vehicle ecosystem, looking at automated parking, and looking at the deployment of um, electric uh, vehicle charging stations and the use of parking by the uh, Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. So here's a, um, a great example of our platform and how we work within the, the area. Collaboration is fundamental to our organizational DNA. Believing and acting upon the, um, the idea that no one is as smart as everyone, the Green Parking Council um, brings together other nonprofit players, government, and not-for-profit planners and developers into a rich environment of collaboration. We've collaborated with many organizations, such as the American Planning Association, and this webinar is um, sort of emblematic of the kickoff of this collaboration with APA's Transportation and Planning Division which we find is a, a natural partnership that expands the opportunity uh, for planners, parking operators, uh, and real estate to collaborate on parking as a sustainable enabler with the natural and built environments. We're changing the nature of parking. We challenge ourselves to do better with a tiered certification program. We enrich and inspire ourselves through sharing of information. We nurture relationships to grow sustainable businesses and communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have some questions, so let's go ahead and just jump right into those. Okay. Does the technology exist, been implemented anywhere, to charge electric vehicles off of the electricity generated by solar panels on the roofs of parking garages? Yes, there are um, several examples in uh, North America where there's a self-contained or island effect where solar canopies are positioned over a surface parking lot and provide connection, either um, AC or DC, to electrical vehicle charging uh, equipment that then can be used by um, electric vehicles to charge. And so that you have companies that install the, um, the solar canopies on parking lots. And in fact, um, one of the um, greenest parking garage is touted as the greenest parking garage is located in Denver, Colorado near the airport called the Canopy Garage which is um, built and operated by one of the founding members of the Green and the um, CEO of the Green Parking Council, John Schmidt, with ProPark and there are many other companies that provide uh, insulation services for putting solar panels and solar equipment above parking lots and garages and that connect directly to the charging infrastructure equipment. Um, there's a little bit more extending it further out. There is now um, designs to look at the um, as that as one of the exhibits I showed in the in the presentation, linking up the parking garage within a smart grid um, ecosystem where you have both um, self-contained distributed energy flowing within that um, environment, that district. 
Okay. Great. Um, it, towards the beginning of the presentation, you had talked about some vehicle trends um, and, and the recession. Have, have vehicle miles traveled changed post-recession? Um, well, yes. I mean, that's some of the information and slides that I showed um, kind of looks at the um, FHWA's recent report and, and some other, and the PERGS report where they looked at the, even though some say we're really in the, not truly out of the recession, but nonetheless, they've looked at the data for the last couple of years. And I think this will be, um, you know, and I know this is closely monitored by um, providers of transportation services and across the country is looking at this trend in uh, BMT and how, whether it's, how it's localized, whether it's just localized within um, congested urban areas or whether it's um, um, has a more disaggregated um, trend effect that occurs within um, suburban areas and, and elsewhere. Uh, but this is something that will be uh, closely monitored. And undoubtedly, since this has caused such a um, spark of interest and, 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 and a discussion about the topic, you'll see um, further um, uh, findings and uh, reports on this topic. Great. Um, a, a recent okay. re yes, a recent resources for the future study found that electric vehicles may actually be contributing to GHG emissions. Auto manufacturers are using these to balance sales of SUVs and other inefficient cars. How do we get the process back on track? Well, I think renewables, um, depending upon what programs are at the state and regional level, are becoming uh, certainly more competitive. California has um, a very strong renewable uh, content within their electrical um, supply offering, and I think you'll see um, the prevalence of um, renewable energy sources, certainly from solar or, or wind and others, um, cogeneration coming into play uh, more and more uh, within the uh, utility um, within the you know within the utility uh, mix. Um, so the content of um, power flowing into the electric vehicle uh, within the total spectrum of things will become uh, universally cleaner depending upon where you're really operating your vehicle. Great. How do you feel about parking day when people take over parking spaces to show what else they could be used for? Yes, um, parking day is coming up. I think it's on September next week on September 20th, uh, which is a great, in my view, um, a great day where um, um, it's kind of um, arisen to become uh, quite a, a movement and also kind of a community uh, festivity of, um, of locating, relocating within a parking spot. Um, some on parking day next week is temporary uh, showcase, but many cities have um, actually uh, reclaimed some of the parking, um, uh, street parking, curbside parking spaces uh, for um, public spaces, for um, landscaping, and, and other for uh, street calming as a contributor to uh, complete streets. So it depends on the. Um, on the community and the setting, um, I think it's um, an indication of some of the uh, creative thinking that is underway, um, both uh, here and, and abroad, to um, reutilize some of our uh, parking assets. Okay. Um, when you when you plug your electric vehicle into a public system or a business's system, who actually pays for it? That's a good question on the charging parameters. If you um, in a public system, in a public parking garage, 
uh, depending upon the situation, it's usually the operator who's providing that as a as a free service. Um, as more vehicles um, come into play and they're utilized more, then there will be a, a chart like like many things. There'll be a charging um, component to this. Um, right now, many um, EV charging stations are being used as an amenity to to draw people to um, the use, the shopping center, or um, to utilize the, uh, the parking, and it's not, um, and, the, and the charge is not explicit within the, um, you know, within the parking space. In some suburban shopping center areas that have um, EV chargers, it's provided by the owner of the parking, of the shopping, of the shopping area, um, but it, there's going to be more of a greater installation that will have more of a draw on the grid, uh, then those things will need to be, um, prices will need to be charged to the user of those uh, those things. And then also this sort of brings up kind of a broader question of, of the um, utility, the rate structure, um, and what will that be. This is, these issues are, are some that are, um, are being um, examined and studied and addressed with various um, implementation measures, it's a little bit too soon to call out exactly kind of the best case or best practices, uh, but many main areas um, that are large adopters and users of electric vehicles and are installing infrastructure are looking at and working with the uh, local utilities, as a whole coalition of um, of entities that are involved and in how to uh, remedy any disparities or look at the uh, proper way to price and rate some of the, uh, the energy that's being provided. Okay. Okay. Um, somewhat related, what will protect smart cities against power outages and rising electricity costs, particularly during the summer? Okay, well, I think there are a few things that can uh, protect tools or solutions that come into play to protect uh, cities when um, there are disruptions either by um, demand or by adverse weather um, events. I think many cities are looking at um, new ways of resiliency and adaptation through the use of uh, energy storage, batteries, um, large batteries are becoming a way of both smoothing the peaks in electrical generation at a, on a building and district scale. Also, there are um, platforms of utilizing uh, microgrid uh, technology within um, areas. Sandia Labs, the, the, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy has um, a long time um, program that is, uh, has several demonstration project sites around the country and will probably become mainstream or commercialized in a few years of, of using uh, a microgrid uh, type of structure to arrangement to um, um, come into play during those punctuated times of, of high energy usage uh, to offset the, uh, the spikes and to smooth the the uh, energy uh, usage. There's also with um, building scale um, software, building in energy management system software that is um, utilized in a few cases to manage the loads and smooth the um, uh, peaks. Um, it's also coupled with um, backup energy generation equipment. Great. How does the Denver Airport parking garage deal with the long-term parking problem? That is, switching the electric chargers from one vehicle to another once each vehicle has been charged. You don't want one charging device to be tied to one vehicle for several days or more while someone is out of town. Um, yeah. I. They have about what is called a valet service for the charging 
uh, infrastructure is housed in the inside of the garage itself, and they offer a service where the valet moves the vehicle from the charger to a parking spot and brings uh, another vehicle to the charger. So there's um, an attendant that's there that um, addresses that um, issue. Okay. Do you believe that municipal parking code plays a role in the parking issues we see in cities today, i.e., one-third of some cities are surface parking lots? Do you advocate for parking policy reform? I think um, parking policy reform um, has always uh, become an important part of, of cities. I mean, parking reform is usually um, within the um, decision-making framework of most city council people address parking reform or regulations or requirements in some form or another. And of course, those discussions can be fairly protracted and heated. Um, I think that parking reform is an important uh, aspect in that we need to right-size uh, parking requirements based on some of the, the uh, concepts that I outlined. Uh, coming up uh, through the APA TPD webinars is a uh, seminar on parking reform by Richard Wilson, which I recommend people to uh, attend and listen to, which will outline a 12-step process to go through to begin to calibrate uh, parking requirements. And I think um, many of the major cities, New York, Boston, LA, are looking at, um, or have looked at, certainly within the transit-oriented development framework, modifying parking requirements and right-sizing parking to fit the needs of the, um, of the project. I think on an area-wide basis, um, cities are looking at parking reform in both in terms of a pricing, a regulatory uh, standpoint, um, and um, also in, in terms of the, the metering uh, system. So I think uh, that um, parking reform is um, becoming more to the forefront in terms of the tools, technologies that we can use. There's more um, uh, more, many more solutions technologically oriented in our, in our toolbox that can really move the needle and to um, reach, help us reach consensus on, um, on creating um, parking reforms. Okay. okay. Um, one last question. Do you have any good examples of communities that utilize shared use parking for park and ride facilities? For example, maybe large commercial parking lots that might designate some spots for park and ride activity? Um, yes, I mean, there are, um, within the framework of, um, of um, transit provider park and ride lots. Uh, there are many examples uh, from the WMATA system, from BART system, uh, from the Long Island Railroad of, of um, shared use parking arrangements. And the questioner could email me and I could provide a list of sort of best practices. Um, there's also a reference document on the APA site uh, that um, goes through uh, best practices and examples of, of shared use, shared parking um, arrangements. Um, so um, that's a uh, good question, and there's some resources out there that can address that. Address that question. Um, have the questioner uh, send me an email, and I'll provide a fuller answer. Great. Thank you. All right, I think that's it for our Q&A, and we've about hit time. Um, for those that are still in attendance, um, I'd like to thank Mark and Gabriella. I, know, I don't think she's on the line anymore, and the rest of the Transportation Planning Division for putting this together today. Um, and a few reminders that you can log your CM credits 
for attending today's webcast by visiting planning.org slash CM. Um, select today's date and presentation title. It will be available for 1.5 CM credits. And we are recording the webcast, and it's available on YouTube. And if you would like a PDF of Mark's presentation, you can email me at planningwebcast at yahoo.com. And for future webcasts, take a look at utah-apa.org slash webcast. So this concludes today's session. Again, thank you, Mark, Gabriella, the Transportation Planning Division. And everyone have a great weekend. Bye-bye.